Major support for these broadcasts is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, MNT Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, All Nation Renovation, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orphanides, Centurion Holdings, Chelsea Lighting, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Investors Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates, Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, The Wickoff Group, Urban American, Ackman Ziff Real Estate, Eastern Consolidated, Goldman Properties, The Moynian Group, Mus Development, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Triangle Equities. They call it Long Island City. It's five minutes away from Manhattan. It's a place that's vibrant. It's a place that's growing. It's a place that is so hot as hell. So what's happening in Long Island City? I brought the, to, together today the people who really know what's happening with Long Island City. My guests today include David Browse, who is the uh, president of Browse Realty and also the president of the Long Island City Business Improvement District. Uh, Eric Benami, who is the president and CEO of Modern Spaces. Tom Elganian, who is the chairman of TF Cornerstone. And last but not least, the really executive producer who really put the show together, my good friend Alan Suna, who's the CEO of Silver Cup Studios and also the principal of a new condo called The Industry. So, how many years are you in Long Island City now? We've been in Long Island City, I guess it's coming up on 31 years. No, we just passed 31 years. I'm sorry. When I get this old, I forget a little bit. I realize. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, how do you look at 2011 compared, you know, we've been doing Long Island City shows for many years. How do you see it now? I mean, a lot of vibrancy? It, it goes, vi vibrancy, you know, it's like if you hit a tuning fork and you see that it vibrates, uh, that means that there's an action and a, and a kind of reaction. What's happened is that you often use tuning forks to tune a piano. And the piano is playable kind of all the time. Long Island City is getting to the point where it's now a piano because it is there, it has happened, and it is growing more. So it is not just happening, you know, it is already established. And we think it's just fabulous. Now, how many years are you developing in Long Island City now? Uh, we've been there since uh, 2003. Okay. And now the waterfront in Long Island City where you're developing, yeah. I mean, it has the greatest view and great convenience. How do you see the last year, you know, with the recession, with the other changes, how do you see people coming there with regard to renting and with regard to purchasing today? Uh, well, during the recession, there, uh, it took a big setback. You know, rents went down considerably. Uh, but it's climbing back up now. We're almost back to where we were uh, pre-recession. And actually, rents are escalating pretty quickly, uh, as are our sales prices. What, what is the, you know, as I was saying prior to the show, a lot of people are very interested, you know, the, the generation Y, you know, like Eric over here, you know, would be running to um, Williamsburg. 
Do you see a lot of very young people, young couples coming to Long Island City? Yes, we see a lot of young people, a lot of new people coming to New York uh, to, that are just entering the, the New York City market, which is our normal uh, clientele. Uh, and now we're actually having uh, uh, more families. The school started construction. Uh, there's a K through eight school going up right now. Let's talk the, about that because I think, you know, this is something that's really important to a neighborhood, especially, you know, what, mm -hmm. what happened because of your holdings in Lower Manhattan and other places. In order for an area to really grow, you need that school. So what are you doing over there? What's happening with the school? Well, the, the school is critical. Uh, there, there is a small uh, uh, primary school, vastly oversubscribed. Uh, and now they're building, well, we gave them the land. They're building a 800-seat um, uh, K through 8 school. And usually when they build these new schools, they're usually very good schools. They get the best teachers. I, I saw this down in Battery Park City years ago. We developed down there, and, and the city put in uh, uh, PS 181, I think it is. Which it happens to be school. one of the best public schools. It's, it's a great school. And then they have that little primary school across the street, which is really uh, sought after. Uh, so that, for a family, it's a great, if you have a good school, it's a, it's a big plus. And in Long Island City, you know, what you have is uh, you'll have schools, you have parks, uh, great waterfront view, big amenity package. It's actually uh, a very decent place and affordable place for young families to live. Four and a half minutes to Grand Central. You live there? I live there. How do you end up living there? I... Uh started brokering some deals over there. I thought it was a great neighborhood and I decided to live there. Moving, I've lived there now for uh, about four years. Um, and I started my company about uh, three years ago. Now the interesting thing is your location is not as convenient for as opposed to the industry or as opposed to Tom's, okay? You're, I mean, it's a great, you're in the old electric building, right? Correct. What do they call it now? Uh, Aris Lofts. And What's the nature of the tenancy in Aris Lofts? Families or singles or what do you? I mean, it's a mi it's a mix. I mean, I think everybody who bought in Aris Lofts back in two thousand six were, I would say, eighty percent of them are were all Manhattanites mm -hmm. who just ended up uh, trying, I guess, being so. He, here's my question: What was the price in two thousand six at the Lofts per I foot? Pay, I paid about nine fifty a foot. And what are they? What are the resales selling for today? Resales are a little bit different than I would say new construction in my building. It's uh, right now it's in probably in the eight hundreds or so. Um, throughout the neighborhood, it's anywhere from in the seven fifties and up. So, and resales right now in the resales are probably averaging about seven fifty a foot. I would say. Now, what what about what what are what are the units selling for the in your condos in? Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, not enough. Uh, uh, we're selling them now around 850 a foot. We, we did one yesterday actually at n almost 950 a foot. Yeah, so there's a... Now, now the, the, the interesting thing, and I didn't forget David because we'll bring him in, but we're getting on the residential subject. The, the nice thing about, and Alan was brought it up prior to the show, is that when you go to Long Island City, you have a 15-year tax abatement. Correct. But the first 10 years, there's no increase in the taxes as opposed to Manhattan where you have the phase in every two years. Correct. And so what happens in Long Island City, you have a flat tax abatement for 10 years, and then it phases in from years 11 through 15, um, you know, gradually. And then after year 15, then it goes to regular taxes. Is that true all throughout Long Island City? Or is that all of Queens? Every, every no, I think it's, I don't know about the rest of Queens, but I know throughout Long Island well, City, city that's, a, yeah. that's how it is. Or, I mean, I mean and that, that's are, a very yeah. unique situation. Yeah, and, and the taxes are very cheap. And, and you know something, very few people are aware of that, because when people talk about 421 A's in general, you know, uh, like in Lower Manhattan or any other part, they know that it's phased in over a time. Now, if this is a true tax abatement for 10 years, that's a, uh, a major savings. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what's interesting, Michael, and I'm not primarily in the residential market, but if you look at what, uh, what Alan said in terms of over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, you started with the artist. You started with singles that wanted a cheaper place in a newer building, and now you're going into what Tom's saying, people that are good, looking for a good education, families, the number of mm -hmm. strollers you see going through Gantry State Park, right. the number of languages you hear. 
people coming from all over the world looking to come to New York City, looking for a clean and a potentially a new building, <coughs> coming to Long Island City at a decent yeah, price. Let's, let's be realistic. Place. You have a building that originally had MetLife. Mm -hmm. Now you have uh, JetBlue moving in over We've there. We've got JetBlue moving in. Their new headquarters is coming in in March. Uh, they've got about 200,000, 220,000 square feet. They're relocating from Darien, Connecticut, from Westchester, and from Forest Hills, Queens. They wanted a centrally located uh, location. They are an edgy, interesting, creative company. They're the only New York airline now. Uh, on their airlines, you can say the I Love New York logo, great branding with uh, Mayor Bloomberg. And uh, why'd they choose Long Island City? Transportation, low cost, relatively new building. At least you were up front, low, low cost. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. No, we we'll we compete on, on price. No, I mean, let, let's be realistic. For an office tenant who makes a profit, mm -hmm. a, a for-profit company, it's great to be in Long Island City sure. because you get a $12 REIT benefit. So effectively, if your rent is 25 to 40 whatever it is, you're reducing it by $12. It's which a $3,000 per employee per year for tenure. Right. The industry. I mean, it, you know, right. You have the even higher because of the studios. So that's a big thing. And then if you want, uh, I mean, when would you ever expect, I mean, especially since Tom and I have been speaking about this for years, when would you see a, a REIT from Canada buy an office building in Long Island City. Right, and that happened in September. I mean, you know, they bought the property from where uh, Tishman Spire uh, and Square Mile put up the building, you know, w with the health. They uh, paid $620 a foot. They gave Tishman Spire a $100 million profit. Uh, they get a great lease with the city. It's you know it's a, a, a triple net lease. Right, and but, but, they've the, got a great but the but product. the investor is looking at a coupon, and yep. that's what it was over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's a good situation. Now, something that Alan brought up before, which I think is important, now, people realize, people think that uh, Roosevelt Island is Long Island City. It is not. It's Manhattan. But now what's happening with this discussion of Stanford and MIT and the other situation. Okay, Cornell. And Cornell may bring exceptional vibrancy to Long Island City. Why don't we discuss that? Well, uh, David and I wrote a presentation yesterday from uh, Seth Pinsky, uh, who uh, heads up the uh, uh, EDC. Uh, that's the New York Economic Development Corporation, and uh, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. And they were talking about the uh, recent request for proposals that went out for the Applied Sciences campus, uh, that they had incredible responses, I think, uh, 28 different responses from uh, individual universities and consortia of universities, and even from eight foreign countries, you know, uh, schools of higher learning from Switzerland, India, you, n you name it. And what the city is trying to do is their model is they want to, in some fashion, emulate something that happened at MIT over the years. And one of the statistics they brought up is that if you took all the graduates from MIT and the businesses that they started you know, out of there, it would be the 17th largest economy in the world. And what they were saying was they're providing the seed capital to uh, start the Supplied Sciences campus and they believe that what it will be, not just an incubator, it will be a place in which uh, businesses will grow from. And they were very specific in terms of pointing out that the only real opportunity that they saw for growth for these new businesses is Western Queens, Long Island City, because it's right there, it's connected by a mass transit, is you know, a driver and a nine iron from one another. And it's because, again, as David pointed out, space is far less expensive, it's far more available uh, than it is in, in a, in Manhattan, even though Roosevelt Island, per se, which is one of the sites that's under consideration and seems to be a heavy favorite in the race, uh, is politically within the scope of Manhattan. It's really an island unto itself. Yeah, but he, here's the interesting situation. Let's say they do take part of Roosevelt Island for this. Roosevelt Island does not have the infrastructure to Ever. take care of what you need. They'll go to apartments owned and developed by Tom and you, They'll go to office buildings over there because Roosevelt Island has limitations with what they have. Right. I mean, do you sell in Roosevelt Island? No, but we get a lot of people from Roosevelt Island who are, are buying or renting right. in Long Island City. I Even mean, there's, there's no really amenities in Lo Roosevelt Island that a lot of their restaurants are delivering to right. Roosevelt Island from Long Island City. And in fact, if one were to be up in the clouds and look at this kind of all over again, uh, it probably could have made some sense, it may still make some sense, because this party isn't over yet, that this Applied Sciences campus should never have been in Roosevelt Island or in Governor's Island or in the Navy Yard, which were three sites that the city owned. It should have been in Western Queens, you know, which is transport, you know, the city is investing 
$100 million in infrastructure improvements. And one of the questions that was asked yesterday, he said, what's, what's infrastructure? I said, well, transportation, roads. And I said, well, you know, uh, uh, we're sitting in, in a spot here in, in Long Island City. Already has transportation. Already has infrastructure. I, I mean, you know, it, you've Rose, got it. I mean, Rose, Island has one subway stop. One subway stop. Governor's and, Island has no subway. You're no, going to take a ferry ride or a gondola back to lower <laughs> Manhattan. And you've got uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is, has the G. The G doesn't even go to Manhattan. No, no, no. I, I so mean, it should be in Long no, Island City. It should be, it should be platforming over the Sunnyside Rail Yards where you have no. New Jersey Transit, you got Amtrak, you got Long Island Railroad, plus seven New York City subway lines. Well, David, no That's fairness. A perfect location. That would be, I think there are a number of opportunities within Western Queens, Sunnyside Yards being one of them. But there are a number of opportunities that really uh, should be explored because one of the things is that what is the city really doing? It's holding an auction. Just like you'd go to a charity auction and you'd get, okay, this guy's bidding for this and this guy's bidding I for that. I didn't realize the city gives away charity auctions. Well, think about this though for a second as a model. And Tom, you've, you've been there where they're auctioning off, live auction, some special kind of a thing, be it a puppy or a trip or whatever the case may be. And somebody's up to whatever the number may be, five of whatever, how many zeros you want to put behind it. Another guy has been bidding against and what have you, he's just marginally under. So the five guy wins. So the good auctioneer, has one in his back pocket, and he says, okay, if you meet the price that this other guy is willing to pay, I got another puppy in the back room. Are you willing to do that? And more often than not, they're always willing to do that. And so we have here so many high-quality universities and you know, just so many high-quality proposals that just there's no need, in our view, to pick one winner. There's a way to make this a super win for New York. I mean, you, you know, if you look at when the Hudson companies and the related companies built the additional buildings, not the initial buildings in Roosevelt Island, you know, it was Cornell. It was Memorial Sloan. Those were the people who moved into those buildings because of the convenience of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I, mean, the, I mean, the biggest problem, as Eric brought out, uh, which is some of the problems slightly in Long Island City, is the retail amenities in Roosevelt Island are terrible. And they're planning to, to change that now that there's related. But what you've done in many of your developments is you've subsidized and you've tried to put in some good retail. Well, the initial plan, uh, master plan for uh, our development was uh, the model they had was West End Avenue. Uh, really no retail, no retail and uh, uh, a series of buildings on either side of Center Boulevard, all uniform height facing into uh, Center Boulevard with very little uh, parkland also. And we convinced the city, or uh, the uh, Econo Economic Development Corporation really, to uh, revise the plan, eliminate a lot of the roads which were unnecessary, and, and it, was, it was a hard fight to get them to accept putting in retail. And, uh, and we knew the retail would be a money loser. But we know people in New York City or Manhattanites in particular, if, if you have to go more than two blocks to a uh, Dwayne Reed, you feel oppressed. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, or if you don't have a supermarket right there yeah, or you, a nail salon. Yeah, you have a Dwayne Reed? Yeah, we happen to have a Dwayne Reed and a supermarket and, uh, and uh, a liquor store and, you know, we're, but, but all I these think, things are subsidized uses. I, I think, uses you know, it. what has happened, especially with Dwayne Reed, I, I mean, Dwayne Reed has become a convenience store. Yeah. They have become, you know, in many of their stores. Supermarket, have, too. Supermarket. Supermarket. Yeah. Supermarket. I mean, they have 4,000 to 5,000 square feet yeah. of food. I mean, they, yeah. they take care of it. Eggs, you know, milk, eggs, juice, everything. everything. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a situation, and it's a, it's a necessity. I mean, people can joke, but, you know, fresh direct is fine, but people also like to have the av availability of walking down when right. you reach 24 no hours, question. you know, and all the situation. How do you see uh, today the sales in the industry? Oh, we've, well, we've just uh, started working with Eric in the last uh, uh, two weeks. Uh, I think his company has been absolutely fabulous. They've brought us a number of uh, offers and some deals. Uh, we just had one uh, uh, last night uh, that uh, was, was great. You know, was what, what's the age of the purchaser? Uh, actually, we, we've had a really interesting mix. We've had some young people that are, you know, young professionals that are entering the market, young couples uh, that are looking for their first home. We have uh, uh, a couple of empty nesters. Uh, you know, people in their 50s and 60s. Uh, we, uh, uh, it was interesting also, we have uh, uh, one of the folks, you know, the largest thing that we built initially was a three bedroom, you know, penthouse up on the seventh floor. 
we have another family that bought two units. They came from Manhattan, uh, bought two units, combined them into a huge, now the largest apartment in the building, into a huge, you know, three-bedroom apartment with, you know, extra, uh, everything's in there. And, uh, and what do they love about it? Why did they move there? It was price and both the, the husband and the wife work. Seven minutes it takes them to go from their apartments to their jobs on the east side of Manhattan. What are the size of the units in your buildings? Uh, on the condo or the rentals? Both. Uh, uh, actually, both. Uh, the, uh, on the condo, uh, one bedrooms to four bedrooms. And on the rentals, studios to, uh, actually, we even have some four-bedroom apartments uh, planned because we anticipate, uh, not now, but uh, in a couple of years, this will be a big family area. So our, our apartment is actually uh, pretty large by Manhattan standards. And... Uh, Here's a question basically for the three of you, because I don't think you really look at this. You know, one of the complaints that people have said to me, especially owners of buildings, is getting mortgages. Are there difficulties again? You know, they just reduced the limits on the, on the maximum mortgages over here. How difficult? And also the lenders have become, you know, points and everything. How, how's that today? You know, for, for, for the purchase of the For the purchase, Yeah, well, you had the 50, 51% business, which... Uh, uh, was to a big to close. To close. Uh, well, uh, what, what, what happened is people couldn't qualify, the building wouldn't qualify. Uh, yes. Fannie and Freddie wouldn't qualify you for, for loans unless you had 51% sales. Uh, then it's sort of like chicken and egg. How do you get to 51% sales without uh, Fannie and Freddie? We were able to do it uh, with a lot of uh, effort. What about you? We're actually, uh, we've already sold, you know, uh, closed on a couple of units. Uh, what Tom says is correct, but uh, there are so many interesting lenders out there now that are not that, that are yeah. willing to commit to lend without pre-sales or lower pre-sale. Uh, it's your market. Who's uh, who's renting? Who's no, who's buying? Who's, who's buying? Yeah, who's who? Who? What? What about the mortgages? People have to buy. I mean, maybe a year ago, a year and a half ago, it was a little yeah. bit more difficult than it is now. I think they're a lot more lenient now. I would think the banks yeah. uh, and there's a lot more banks that are open to. Lending in buildings that just opened up, or buildings that are uh, below fifty-one percent, or even yeah, a couple. Even we're seeing still. I've seen maybe like one or two people doing ninety percent financing in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, typically it's about twenty percent. So here's a question: We know Tom's property product is something. You know his rental property. You know it's luxury. It's on the water. What are what are the other rentals uh, in Long Island City going? The other areas of Long Island City. The only other really buildings that are, there's not really that many other rental buildings in the neighborhood. You have people who buy condos and rent those out, and then you have the walk-ups. There's maybe two other buildings, smaller, like 20, 30 unit buildings that are rentals from a couple years ago. And other than that, it's walk-ups or a lot of these uh, people who bought condos who are renting them out. Probably right now in the neighborhood is about 100 or so these investors. Give me the but, rent. But, but under we, construction. 45, about 45, on those units, about $45 a foot. We've also got a whole bunch of new buildings that are start, starting to rent on Queens Plaza. So you've got the Crescent Club, which we talked earlier about, that was a failed condo that is now going rental, and they're performing about $40 a foot. Uh, Packard Square is also on their next phase. They're rented up uh, entirely their first building. They also subsidize their retail. They've got a you know a small market in the base, and they're now on to their next building, which I think they're also looking at the low 40s. So when we're talking about a 24 uh, 24 7 community you know we're talking about retail that Tom brings out we're talking about restaurants what's happening with the restaurants who's opening up what what are you about saying? the New York Times last week uh, it was a great piece on I know and it's booming so who who's opening well, up well, the, the, that uh, tornasol guy is opening another uh, restaurant he has a little wine bar it's uh, Vernon Boulevard is is sort of morphing gradually into being uh, like Smith Street in Williamsburg in a very low-key way. It sort of reminds me of when I grew up in Forest Hills. Uh, there was a, a the main street. I think it's called Austin. Austin, 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 Austin Street. We Queens boys have to remind right, you. Right, Austin. Right. Austin. <laughs> it was a sleepy little villagey street. Right, but then it five and ten on it and stuff. Yeah. And now you go to Austin Street. It's a uh, <laughs> Uh, Tom's exactly right. You can get French from Tornasol, you can get uh, Thai from Tuk Tuk, you can uh, get uh, Madeira, Cuban. You, literally, you go up and down, uh, it's the United yeah. Nations of food. And they're amazing restaurants. And it's and a great lunch crowd. they're it's not a great subsidized. Crowd. Not a single one along yeah. there is subsidized. Yeah. That's right. But yeah, Vernon Boulevard, I mean, I, I also lived on Austin Street. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you know what it was like. Well, yeah. You don't even know. You were too young. Born. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Vernon Boulevard is, is, 
the Corner Bistro from Greenwich Village is opening up a place on yeah. 47th Road in Vernon. Um, there's probably about another 10 or dozen or so restaurants opening up right now in the neighborhood. But they're also starting to go north on Jackson. You've got you know, the, the Burger Garage, which is the Palm Steak guys, which you know. They decided where's our first burger place going to be in New York City? Long Island City on and, Jackson. And you know what else is interesting? Where the Swing Line building is, because the guys came to me on a discussion for financing, you have the tennis club over there who's doing relatively well. Yeah. You know? And it's you know it's a little bit out of the way, but it, you know they, they bring a lot of people in because it's a beautiful facility. They And as opposed to you talking about running bar mitzvahs and weddings in Silver Cup, they are running. Uh, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you, you asked about rental units, you know, in places other than along the waterfront. Um, you know, Tom's uh, uh, brother uh, is, is started uh, construction on a 700 unit, uh, 750 unit rental building uh, diagonally across the street from us, right by the Citibank building. Um, so Plus, you know, he, he has two other parcels there. Uh, he could build uh, almost three million square feet. That's right. Yeah, and uh, the banks and are very happy to give him the money. I know all the lenders. Okay. I had. And, and then you yeah. have, and then you have, you know, around the corner on Jackson Avenue, you got the Walkoffs, um, you know, Jerry and David, which are going for an adjustment in their uh, zoning, which I, I think will happen. And what about the studio business? But, oh, we got to the studio business. No, we only have about a minute. You got to get to the studio business. Studio business is fabulous. My only problem is, is we're victims of our own success. And what I mean by that is for us to buy more land, to build more studios, the price is too high. So <laughs> that's, that's really our problem that's at a, the moment. That's an interesting question. How much is developable land in Long Island City for residential selling for today? On the main drags, they're getting close to $100 a foot per buildable foot. On the side streets, I've been looking at land that's you know anywhere between 60 and $90 a foot right. per buildable foot. And over the, how do you see that compared to the heydays when land was being sold? Well, our our cases. Uh, I'm not talking about yours, but uh, and we really have. Oh, yeah, we bought. Uh, actually, I assembled all that uh, property that now, now Henry's, right. and I we know. paid uh, maybe fifty dollars a foot on mm -hmm. average. Mm -hmm. And as as we got larger and larger pieces, that we had more holdouts to deal with, and he, probably he, paid here's more the promise. We, we you know, yeah. thirty minutes have passed, and. Um, Later on in the season, I want to bring all of you back to talk about what's happening in Long Island City in 2012. I'd like to thank David Browse, Eric Benami, Tom Elganian, and Alan Suna. See you next week. Major support for these broadcasts is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, MNT Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, All Nation Renovation, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Chelsea Lighting, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Investors Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates, Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, The Wickoff Group, Urban American, Ackman Ziff Real Estate, Eastern Consolidated, Goldman Properties, The Moynian Group, Muss Development, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Triangle Equities.